University of Warwick and my main responsibility is for e-learning and embedding uh, technology. Now as you guys are already interested in disruption and uh, technology and technology certainly does disrupt things so that doesn't always make those of us who are encouraging that disruption the most popular people on earth um, and disruption is uncomfortable in its very nature um, but we do need every now and again to get uncomfortable and to go beyond our comfort zones and to experience new things and to be open to new things. So this really that I'm going to very briefly report on today um, was a disruptive innovation within language teaching, but it was one that was already built on some disruption long-standing that started five years ago when we'd started to look at virtual exchange. So you can see here the hashtags I've given you. I tweet, by the way, is at Warwick Language. So if you are on Twitter, you'll see that I've been, well, I, Twitter has been auto-tweeting for me some of the links that are connected um, to what I'm talking about today. And the reason for that really is because six years of development doesn't really condense down very effectively into 15 minutes. So I'm going to be picking on little bits and hopefully there'll be some links and things that are coming out through Twitter. And also you've got some handouts that I sent, which I was hoping we'd have maybe hard copy. Um, so there are some handouts for you too. I don't know where they are, Daniel, but maybe they'll be on the website or something. Oh, okay. So people have had those already. Great. Thank you. So there are sort of follow-up bits and pieces there as well. So already we're getting disruptive, and I'm asking you not just to sit and listen, but, and, but also to engage in a discussion at the end of this presentation, but also to go to various online spaces and collect bits and pieces. But that is the reality, really, of the um, working environment for pretty much all of our students and young people. And those of you with um, kids at home, I have young men at home, and I'm very much aware that most of their lives is mediate, are mediated through their phones. Um, so dipping in and out of the online or the computer mediated is very much part of the normal life. Um, but it does involve an awful lot of skills and skills acquisition. And they're not necessarily uh, thinking about the skills that they probably already have for their social lives and how they could impact in their study lives and reinforce and support the work uh, that they have to do. Um, so where I'm going to start, as you can see here, is with badges in the physical and root it in the physical. I put my badges on today, or a badge, or a couple of badges on today. I'm a member of the Association for Learning Technology which is what this badge is all about, uh, and a CMALT holder, which is really to do with the journey that I've taken as a language practitioner into learning technology and becoming a learning technologist and becoming part of a community of practice so that I can learn from others. Um, I've certainly had a huge learning curve over the past five or six years getting involved in um, um, virtual exchange and also creating and maintaining um, a portal, which is a Moodle-based portal called Languages at Warwick. Um, so that's a community I've very much been involved in. And I think really, you know, badges, I don't know whether you were part of this, I certainly was back in the 70s, badges were things you collected in yeah. order to give a, a visible sign of things you were into. Yeah, and, and certainly I collected my CND badges and my, um, you know, Maggie Out badge and these sorts of things over the 70s and 80s. It was a huge trend as well in, for uh, pins, they called them in France, mm. um, for collecting and showing, making a quick visual um, statement <clears throat> about your um, interests and the things that you supported. And I think there's a very close tie up between online use of open badges and that physical phenomenon that we're more aware of, because they're more sophisticated. They're not just pictures, they actually carry hard-coded metadata with them. Um, I'm also gonna mention very quickly, I'm, I happen to be um, co-chair of the Open Education SIG for Alt. Um, so I'm very interested to hear Catherine and to find out what's going on in open education at Coventry as well. Um, and we've got Open Education Week coming up next month, very, very shortly as well. There'll be all sorts of webinars and things going on that we'll be running um, and that are coming from here as well. So it's good to yeah. know that when we're physically so close together, we can join these things up. I'm also going to quickly explain that hashtag OIE, that is Online Intercultural Exchange. Um, so what that is all about <coughs> is 
um, connecting learners usually, usually of language uh, in task-based activities to collaborate with people who are perhaps learning their language in other countries. So reaching beyond the institutional and beyond the uh, walled gardens that we already have around our institutions in order to connect, sometimes for very short, specific tasks for just a few weeks. Mm. Uh, sometimes, as we have with Clermont Ferrand, a partnership that's gone on now for years, but that evolves every year. And this particular implementation was done last year and is going to be, well, is, um, will be published in April, uh, and I think I gave you the link uh, around that. Clavier is very close to my heart. So Clavier is the virtual exchange um, that we've fostered over five years. It's a large scale um, virtual exchange, and, and that's quite unusual. We have about a thousand students connecting every year mm -hmm. online virtually, and what we try to do is to take them through task sequences, some formal, some informal, some class-based, some join in if you want to mm. um, and really what we what we look to do is to help them um, navigate these virtual spaces so on the french side they tend to be in google docs everything tends to be mediated through google docs on our side we have a central portal that everybody is involved in and that then feeds in and aggregates content that's going on outside and elsewhere so we've been doing that for five years and refining our tasks, and our tasks are available on an uh, EU website called unicollaboration.eu, uh, where you can look at the task sequences, and the word clavier is um, <coughs> the word you'd be looking out for. Um, clavier and that particular image there was designed by a student. We were very keen at the outset of this um, a fairly sort of serendipitous and random um, virtual exchange. We didn't set out, we didn't have a project bid or set out to create a virtual exchange. Um, myself and another tutor in Clermont Ferrand bumped into each other over a conversation on a blog, on Steve Wheeler's blog, and said, wouldn't it be good if? And it kind of evolved and grew from that. So it was very much a grassroots, um, it's sort of uh, rhizomatic growth that we saw happening in Clavier. It's not just virtual. Every year for the past five years, we've had staff trips and student trips between the two exchanges. <coughs> so not just um, about students and their language learning. It has expanded into all areas, usually led by um, students themselves. So some, have, some of them have decided to get into video. So they have a YouTube channel and they connect with um, a colleague in Poland and they exchange uh, short video clips about what life is like in a French university in, a war in Warwick and in Poland. So the students themselves have sort of initiated a lot of the different directions that we've gone off in over time. So really what we started to do then was look at the, the skills that these students are acquiring as they're mediating this, because an awful lot of it in the first place, as you can imagine, in one portal course, if you've got a thousand people, to actually connect with anybody and have any meaningful connection and to engage in any tasks, they need to understand how to manage their digital identity. They need to think about how they create a profile, how they show themselves to others, uh, what's in it for them, why would they want to connect, are we just telling them to do stuff or is this something that they actually want to do? So it was very important to us that we actually gave them um, ways also of identifying the skill sets that we were seeing being used um, and identifying the value of those to their future activity. Um, and a lot of this we've done sort of a series of qualitative and quantitative um, research over the last um, five years into their activity. And a lot of this is sort of identified to us that there are some students who have very clear, a very clear idea of what they want to get out of this situation. And, and largely it is about improving their communicative competence, which is great, but also sometimes it's about, I want to get an internship um, in France, and how do I go about that? And from the French side, you know, what do you know about working in America? And we get sort of thrown off that, and oh, we're not quite in there, but they, they can throw all sorts of things in to the mix. And then they have to find their way through. This isn't very staff directed. This is more sort of staff observed mm -hmm. than directed in lots of ways. 
Um, so really what they have to do is to think about their skills and what we need, needed was a way of, rec of recognizing or helping them recognize the importance of these skills. Because we could see quite clearly that our students are very, very different. Our two cohorts are hugely different. So our Warwick students largely are institution-wide language students. Very often they're international students rather than UK students. Very often they're taking advantage of the fact they're in Warwick, not just to get their law degree or their economics or their maths or their history degree, but also to add another European language. So they may actually be with us for a year, they may be with us for three years to, to get the, their full degree, but they're taking every opportunity that they can get to learn a language. And some of them are absolute beginners in French and some of them are quite advanced. So we've got really a very self-motivated group on the Warwick side, a group of students who generally are interested in all things, all possibilities that are available to them. On the Clermont side, we have a group of students, and I'm sort of generalizing, which is always dangerous, um, but a group of students who are largely sports science students, and they have to learn English, they have to get to a certain level of English in order to be able to um, graduate. So as you can imagine, some of them are not that impressed with English. Some of them really are leaning far more towards American English anyway. Uh, and why would we want to connect with English people in Warwickshire and whoever's heard of Warwickshire anyway? You know, we're not exactly San Francisco. So for them, the whole business of actually engaging <coughs> with their English learning in this way, in a self-motivated way, is a big challenge. Mm. So already that sort of heterogeneous group brings some interesting challenges. And I certainly would not um, say to you that actually, you know, of the thousand people in there every year, all 1,000 are desperately connecting and speaking to each other. We know they're not. We collect the data, but what we do see is a genuine interest from those who are motivated to connect. And what we do see, particularly after we've had visits, um, is a, a increased interest in that when we've got real people. And we certainly see a Facebook effect. When you share a Google Doc with photos of your class and photos of, of a partner class, that has an effect. Straight away, people look at it, oh yeah, I'd like to talk to that one. And then they go back in and try and find those people and uh, track them down. We also get the sort of a knock-on effect around open badges, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. So when I, with Miriam Hawke at the OU, looked at what open badges could do for us in this situation to help make these skills more explicit and to help celebrate the good stuff that is going on, um, we wanted to look at the experience. So the handout that I sent out gives you two key pieces of research that we hinged our work around uh, last year. One from Cross and Galley at the OU, talking about the learning arc um, and different positioning or possibilities of functions and roles of badges, um, some positive, some less positive. And um, alongside that as well, we were looking at um, O'Dowd and Ware. So Rob O'Dowd is one of the leading telecollaboration researchers in, in language acquisition. Um, and he produced, a, uh, or O'Dowd and Ware produced a taxonomy of badges, um, so uh, of tasks, sorry, around online intercultural exchange. So we wanted to bring those two pieces of information together and see whether we could identify within our courses what would work best in terms of positioning badges. And the journey that we went on was really, really useful in terms of identifying that actually in order to position a badge, and make sure it has the right effect, not a demotivating effect, but a positive motivational effect and some way of recognizing skills, we needed to look very closely at task design. And, and that's a really useful professional thing to do when you're setting up virtual exchange. So that was kind of a knock-on effect that we weren't really aware of. That, you know, we're still in early days, but we, we have some sort of preliminary results. Um, the other piece of experience that we built on was the DeSeco report, which I think, again, I've tweeted, and that is a UNESCO report on skills. And that's, that was very useful because we could see that our students sit in the overlapping areas. There's a Venn diagram of three sets of skills, using tools interactively, 
um, making sure that you have a, a heterogeneous group because clearly that's important to bring people together and have these conversations and um, uh, acting autonomously and really all the tasks that we design sit at the overlaps sometimes bang in the middle of all three um, so it was important that we understood that and could build on that in order to position and suggest the positioning of badges In order as well to understand the sort of frame of reference we're working on, we needed to look at language learning and language acquisition from an interdisciplinary standpoint, from an e-learning and skills standpoint, from a sociological standpoint, and a lot of language learning and language acquisition theories tend to be based in sociology, but also from a psycho psychological point of view, particularly around motivation. What makes somebody want to maintain a language? Those of you who speak other languages or learn other languages know that it's an ongoing path. And as fast as you're learning, the language is changing and moving on. Um, so it's quite a challenge to acquire a language skill. Um, and we didn't want to, our badges to turn up as uh, one of Cross and Galley's entrencher roles, where actually you know, the good are just getting better and the weak are just becoming more and more disassociated with the whole process. So there's a, a huge challenge there. Um, we looked at Decky and Ryan's work um, on, on psychology and motivation, where we, have to, we know that we have to be particularly careful, especially with young people, in using reward systems, because if you add reward systems, you can reduce their intrinsic motivation, and actually we want to obviously increase it. Um, so there were certainly things there that we were concerned about. But through the, um, through the work that we did around it, we could see that actually there was a value in open badges, in putting, putting them out there. So we tried to work then towards a framework. So if there's a value, how do we decide which go where and how we use them? And we're now in that sort of phase of the project because now we come back to our language teaching community. So we'll be at the telecollaboration conference in next month talking to practitioners who have been engaged in online intercultural exchange and asking them, OK, with your students collaboratively, where would you put these badges on your tasks? Would they be quick and dirty? A lot of ours were quick and dirty. A lot of ours was, were if you upload a photo and you make a reasonable contribution to a forum, bam, you've got a badge. It's a very low level badge. But we did see from the um, interaction that it actually was helping people to sustain their interest in the forum. I'm sure most of us, if you're using Moodle and you're trying to get people engaged in fora, you can see, that, you know, a lot of young people going old tech, not really interested, pretty dull. Um, so, you know, putting a badge in there is a way of just getting sustaining interest and, and helping people to build um, their skills and their communicative skills. So there's certainly areas that we needed to look at. Um, how am I doing time-wise? I'll move on because I've only got a few slides. So we've got the framework, which hopefully I've tweeted or have tweeted, and you'll be able to... Um, to see that it's basically uh, looks at, it's quite a nice interactive wheel, just frameworks.com um, gives you a nice way of building an, an online framework. So it enables you to look at the task sequences that you've designed for your virtual exchange, it's a very specific context, um, and decide which type of badge, whether it's a one, two, or a three from the Cross and Galley framework, you feel is the most appropriate. But one of our main um, conclusions from the approach was actually that you need to ask the students. Mm -hmm. So we might think this is the best place for it to be, but how did they receive it? And we did some in interesting interviews. So I had a student, for example, who uh, did a walkthrough and I asked, asked students to show me their, the badges they'd earned and to tell me what they made of them. Um, who, she did a walkthrough to her uh, Moodle page and she said, oh, yes, there's my badge. I haven't got a clue what it's for. <laughs> so I said, well, click on it. <laughs> so she clicked on it. And then she could see that, you know, there's a, a description of what she did that led to it. So then there was a sort of light bulb moment of, ah, oh, that's what it's all about. But we're a long way from students actually valuing or understanding how such things could be valued. Um, 
the, the beauty of, of using open badges and, and the digital is because we're engaging the students in that digital environment anyway. So it doesn't make sense to give them either a physical token or a, or a, you know, a stamped certificate. But it can make sense if, if the badge criteria are very clear and visible when they click on something and they see what they can do with it and where it goes next. And of course, these open badges are portable. They can take them away with them as well. So the framework is what we are going back to our community with. I'm not sure how many of you have used open badges or have a Mozilla pack pack, backpack, but they're free. Oh, are you? A couple of projects with them. Oh, great. Yeah, it's getting exciting. I, yeah, they're, they're not very widely used. No, we're, we're very much at the sort of beginning of this journey and, and institutionally they're, they're not on the radar, I think. But we have seen, we've, we have got this Open Badges conference in just a few weeks time where we're pulling together all um, investigations into in HE uh, use of Open Badges. Um, when I first heard about Open Badges, I was very sceptical. You know, this was great when I was a teenager, but I don't really do it very much now as, as an adult. But of course, we do do it in lots of ways without thinking about it. You know, we do surround ourselves with things that, that talk of what we've done and what experience and expertise we have. Um, but I must admit, I found it quite compulsive once you start to collect them. And then you start to think, mm, shall I do that conference? Oh, I'll get a badge. Yeah, I'll do that <laughs> conference. <laughs> So it kind of, you know, becomes an influencer as well, but it also becomes a sign of community. Um, so those are our preliminary conclusions, and obviously we'll continue to discuss this with the um, language acquisition community, language learning community. We're very keen that this could be just part of a process. It's not the be all and end all. Open badges are something you can collect from any learning experience. So in the States, for example, taking your children to a library where they engage in um, an exploratory activity can lead to the award of an open badge. It crosses the formal and the informal, which is why it interests me particularly. Because language learning, if you're going to be a language user, and certainly if you're going on to employment as a language user, needs to be an ongoing process. When you leave university with your degree, I remember my own case, finishing my French degree and thinking, well, now how do I use it? Now how do I continue to uh, connect and use it? Because now you're physically based somewhere else. Of course, the internet has helped that. It has changed that to an extent. But anything you need to keep on learning across your life, um, you need this aspect of portability. And you also need these symbols rather than um, descriptive criteria that employers aren't going to be bothered to, um, to read. So we're seeing in the States um, algorithms being used by employers looking for open badges that signify certain skills. Um, so we are seeing uh, changes in sort of people's awareness, certainly in careers and skills of open badges. So that's where we are. That's what we've done. And thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I look you forward to. <clears throat> well, I think the format is that I start now, rather than we get a chance to ask Teresa questions. Is that how we'd like to do it? We could be flexible. Has anyone got a burning question for I Teresa? Actually, I wanted to ask about accreditation, so about applicants employers. Is that something that maybe yeah. we'll go into eventually? I think at the moment it's kind of just an alternative way of making it certainly in our context making skills visible that otherwise are not even seen. So our students, for example, who are on an institution-wide language program, on their HEAR record, it will show that they have studied a language, um, but it won't show how they've done that. So in the case of French, the fact that they've been engaging in, in, in computer-mediated communication isn't recognized, it isn't there. So that means the student has to explain it, which is quite an uphill journey. Um, and it you know, makes it quite difficult when you think about the sort of proportion of time um, relevant to their entire degree. So in thinking about how it can be useful in, instead of just an incentive, um, would you, could you see it then, like people use letters after their names and their signatures, could you see them putting their badges there? I can, and then employers I can see can click it. on it and they can see what they've actually done? I, I can see it. I don't think it would hit that level of... Um, 
open badges are about micro credentials. So, you, you know, you probably need 5,000, you need thousands and thousands of open badges to equate to the letters after your name or whatever. But so, so what you've got is a way of recognizing the experiences that you've had throughout your life, the learning experiences you've had, which in some cases are probably even more important than the qualifications. But also you've got a way of um, displaying your profile through a CV, and we are seeing a very, a very slow, because I think in HE, certainly in the UK, we're quite slow to move towards the digital. We're, we're seeing employers ask for um, digital evidence. So my son very recently applied for a, a role in London, and that was a, a research post. And having filled in all the online um, CV and everything else, he was then asked to send a link to a two-minute online showcase of his skills. Now, that is the first time I've seen it being used, but it, you know, if it's being used by research agencies in London, it will be used elsewhere. I could see it having a place in like the health health professions and things where you have CPD and you have to re-register and be pin you've got these badges yes. where you've got to I'm thinking primarily yeah. who's the audience for yeah. is it employers well the, the it's totally around a student ownership or learner ownership of their learning experience but having said that, so in your in my backpack there are lots and lots of different badges. I can then draw those in and make collections and share a set of those badges that are relevant to a particular set of skills or something that I'm applying yeah. for. So the ownership is, and we've been saying this for many years, I think, in careers that we are, you know, we're in port, the, the era of portfolio careers. But actually, I'm, you know, I'm not 100% sure.
You'll ask me to speak about two um, oil projects that I've been involved in um, as a part of the research team. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about two individual projects um, and then sort of bring together some summaries at the end. Um, my background, just very briefly, is um, in health and life sciences. So I'm an occupational therapist by professional background, um, although I've been working as full-time researcher now since 2010. But i am still got my loyalty to HLS and social scientist by background. Um, and now I'm a reader in arts-related research and pedagogy and doing all sorts of wonderful things across the whole of campus. Um, but I want to talk about two projects, the first of which um, is an oil project that was very much rooted within uh, the discipline of occupational therapy. Um, and this project came about not least because of a pilot study that I'd done, looking at graduates' perspectives on how well they felt they were prepared for the complexity of practice. Um, and certainly within our profession, mental health um, for occupational therapists is a part of it, 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 I guess it, it needs some work in terms of its influence and visibility. And so this felt a really important project to get, get our graduates to tell us what is missing from our curriculum. What what's, do you think would really improve and help you prepare better for when you get out there, you've got to hit that floor running. So we got some funding from the World Federation of Occupational Therapists because it's a big agenda item for the profession that we look at our mental health practice. Um, and really today I'm speaking on behalf of a wide group of people. Um, who were part of this project. So what we're trying to do, look at understanding students' expectations and their disciplinary understandings. Um, how to equip them for a global practice, how to equip them to be interculturally sensitive, to be able to be visible, influential practitioners. Um, so we joined forces with um, three universities. Um, and our design was very much around trying to um, get the students to think about um, ways of dealing with complex scenarios that our graduates were having to manage. So we had this model where our graduates donated complex scenarios and they didn't, donated those by developing um, video vodcasts. Um, and those were given to our final year students um, and they then had to problem solve those scenarios in international discussion forums. And the, the graduates helped facilitate those discussion forums. So this is a really nice sustainable model. So this year's final year students will be next year's graduates who will donate more complex scenarios for our final year students. And what we were doing was doing this across three institutions. The University of Cape Town, which you would think would have some very different socio-political contexts and issues for global practice, and also colleagues in Belgium, who actually were doing quite entrepreneurial work in terms of private practice. Um, so some quite different um, perspectives in terms of colleagues who were involved in this and ourselves here at Coventry. So what we did was um, work with our graduates. Um, I, I'd been involved in a sort of analysis with our graduates across these three institutions to look at their practice. And so we already had this group of graduates who were willing to donate these scenarios. Um, and our students, there were 216 students in all across three institutions who were on this sort of virtual um, platform where they could engage with the graduates and look at these, these um, scenarios. And they were put into 20, 20 groups, okay, 216 students, internationally mixed, so we've got Belgian UCT and Coventry students in each forum talking together with graduates about practice issues. They could log on to the site from any mobile laptop um, device. And we had this website that was developed um, because it, this was about a, a collaboration of graduates um, and, the, and the final year students developing um, resources together. So they co-created the module resources. They would share news feeds from their respective countries. They would share local practice issues. They shared photographs for a gallery. We were using news feeds that were coming in. And it was a very interactive site. Um, and each institution housed this module within their own program. So our final year students had it housed within an entrepreneurship and um, management module. And so each institution managed their own assessments because this was going to be an assessed piece of work. So the students had that commitment and buying. I'm involved in this and it's also part of my, my formative and summative assessment. And here at Coventry, the students' um, formative assessment was to design some storyboards, some, some creative ways in which they could talk about the scenarios and what it was thinking 
getting them to think about within their practice. Their summative assessment was then to develop digital stories, which they could use as a sort of career narrative to take out with them and help them think about what am I learning about myself and how am I going to promote myself out there in my professional practice. So I was involved to formally research this. We had the funding from the World Federation of OT. It was quite a high profile project for the profession. It ran this last year, it's running this year, it's just finished again now. Um, and what we were trying to do was look at examining in particular the students' intercultural sensitivity at working across these three uh, institutions with all these other students, graduates and uh, undergrads, and just generally get their experience of what it's like to engage in this type of pedagogy. And I, I just need to say this is framed in a sort of inquiry-led learning. So very much around students having to get to understand their world and explore their world and be very active in participation and dialogue um, in terms of, of, of how this was framed within the curriculum. So the students are at Coventry um, work within inquiry-led sort of framework. Um, just very quickly, um, we used descriptive case study methodology. We were situating ourselves within social constructionist per perspectives. Um, in terms of data collection, we use the ISS. Um, and um, I can give you a paper that's been written about all this with more detail about this tool. It was used pre and post the, the module. Um, and it particularly tries to pick up students' interaction engagement, their respect for cultural difference, their interaction confidence, interaction enjoyment, interaction attentiveness. Um, so that was a quantitative technique. We used module evaluations as well as feedback from the students from the three institutions. And we also used a more qualitative technique, which is called the cut-up technique, which I love, which is where students each week, this is for six weeks, they donate a maximum of 50 words about the experience of being involved in these discussions that week. And they send them to me, and then at the end of six weeks, I send them their 50 words times six weeks back to them, and they put it into a storied narrative. So they're collecting their own data, and then they're analyzing their own data, and they're giving it back to me as a story. And it's a really nice technique to use that we borrowed from media. Um, so we use those two different types of data collection. Um, and then um, I just want to share with you some of the findings. So pre and post tests for those students who completed the ISS, we saw statistically significant improvement in their um, ISS scores in terms of particularly the interaction engagement and interaction confidence for intercultural working practices. Um, and um, in terms of um, the, the qualitative data, I'm going to have to whiz through this. <laughs> Look, it's 5-2, um, that we saw this beginnings phase, this sort of sense of trepidation and anxiety of students engaging in this virtual environment. I mean, this is what Teresa's been talking about, how to start these conversations. Our commentary students are not new to having to engage in online discussion, but they are new to having to engage in an intercultural, international online discussion with students from Cape Town and Belgium who had different epistemologies and different ideas around practice. So they weren't all as well as having to think about how some students would post quite long essays as a little post and others would, would come in with a one-liner, they were, they were struggling to think about how to engage and what they wanted to offer themselves in that setting. And also to think about how it was challenging their professional identity. It wasn't just the etiquette of engaging online, it was also that, well, how does this connect with my local practice and understanding of who I am as a practitioner, and my therapeutic reasoning? etc. So there was this trepidation and anxiety, but nonetheless these students really engaged with this creative side of the project in really valuing the fact that they were using real scenarios. They're not fake, you know, that they're having to do something that is something they will face when they're in practice. And it gave them that extra motivation, not least because the graduates themselves are also coming to it and saying, you know, that, you know, these are ideas that we've had to face and, and helping problem solve. There was no doubt that sort of navigating the site and, and looking at the vodcast and uh, we had question prompts to help guide some discussion and facilitate discussion. For some students, it was overwhelming. Um, I mentioned the CU students are quite used to using online forums, but the Cape Town students and Belgian students, it was somewhat more novel to them. And so it felt at times that there wasn't that intercultural engagement that we would have hoped for because of this sort of 
concern or trepidation about that engagement. And I think this says a lot about the facilitation of these sorts of sessions and, and how this side of pedagogy is just not bolted onto programs that otherwise aren't integrated into an international perspective. Um, and that tutors and academic staff are also given that space and time to think about how to facilitate the narrative that comes from international conversations and how to get students to think about how they privilege certain perspectives and what their values are and so there's 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 a lot of work around this for staff and students in terms of that nurturing of the international learning space um, and to get the conversations and discussions to flow um, I think I'm just going to sort of move on to uh, look at the, 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 the next project because that just gives you a flavour of it. The next one was very different in that it was a fine art project um, with students from another three institutions. Um, and again, this is a very different disciplinary perspective, but it's all around creativity and art practice. And in this project, we have three cities. Hashtag three city link involves Regina University in Canada, Coventry University here in the UK, and Gimri University in Armenia. So we have three very different, again, geographical locations. We have fine art students, first and second years, across these three institutions, thinking about ways in which they can look at their narratives in their own cities. And these cities have got their own histories and their concerns and problems. The Regina one, certainly around the indigenous people in Canada, the, the Gimri um, students are facing all the concerns post-war and natural disaster. And in Coventry here, we're a centre of peace and reconciliation following the World War II. So that these projects um, were getting students to think about how arts and the arts practice could help shift narratives for cities and, and how they could contribute in that way. And this was very much based around using social media as a way that students could connect. Um, this project was designed to run around three phases. A research phase, well, again, we've got around 200 and plus students on this across these three universities. And the students, again, are, are um, grouped together so that they, they're working in small groups with the other two institutions, so there's an international mix. And they're encouraging the first research phase, which lasted a month, of them finding out about one another's cities be, through using Skype, through being taken on sort of walking lectures around their cities, through using Facebook and, and, and Twitter, um, and having Google Hangouts to talk about um, structures, architecture, domestic life in their respective cities. And then in a live phase, which lasted two weeks, um, there was two hours a day for two weeks where the students were committed to be together. Now, this is over 10 hours of time difference. So we're having to think about the Canada students working early in the morning and the UK students working later in the day, but hanging out to have some opportunity to do some creative work together. Um, and, and this was also a public gallery space. So it was opened out beyond the classroom, beyond the students to the public and that public interface. In the documentation phase, there's um, um, a magazine and a newsletter and a wiki site that was developed that would house all the students' artwork and also um, enable the archiving of materials and the discussions to continue. And you can follow it there on that hashtag. Again, we were evaluating this. Um, we, we, I mean, I think the most striking thing to offer from the evaluation here is that the students, um, I think for the first year students, they were very much not used to the studio practice. This was their first, one of their first projects they were involved in and they were immediately thrown in to having to work internationally in a very different setting. We've got the second years who are also working on this project who have been used to more studio-based work here in Coventry, who are now working with first years they haven't worked with before and also working with international students. So there was a lot of disruption in terms of the classroom for the students involved. Um, and I think as well, the students had pri prior to the, this project perhaps thought about their artwork as a very individual endeavour. And this project threw it open to think about artwork that wasn't complete, artwork that was incomplete because it was more about a group process and group dialogue and work in progress. And the actual completeness and wholeness of the work was the coming together of the, th of the three different groups of students. But what we did find was that immediately we, after the project, through the module evaluations, there was, there was some um, 
you know, feedback from the students about, you know, the, the, the I guess the social media and the different platforms used being a distraction. Um, maybe that their requests for information were always responded to by the students and they felt that was slowing down their work. Um, I mean, we did have Facebook use pretty much um, as, as a, a main focus rather than Twitter. And that the, the students were using Skype, but again, it was Skype's not always that great, is it? And I think as a way of trying to uh, engage the smoothness and the interaction, there, there were certainly things we can learn about the different use of those technologies to engage students in this creative endeavor. But what the students were finding out um, was this ability to communicate with people in these different cultures and how that opened up their options for their own future art practice. Um, and I, I think, you know, this opportunity to have to, um, have to think about the public interface, raise their ambition as well, because it was this public space. Um, and it was, I think, for students that we, we followed up two months after the project finished, they realized how much they'd learned. I think at the time they were struggling with all the different dynamics, and in the heat of it, it was all quite involved and chaotic for them. But they came to appreciate afterwards how they would have gone into that differently had they had that chance again. So this is a lot of what we've learned in terms of what they would do differently. Um, you know, to, to not gloss over this idea of what you can gain from the translocal communication. Embrace this risk and uncertainty. Um, and, and embrace the un unfamiliar and strange, you know, to broaden their horizons, which they certainly felt and I, I can say that the work that the students produced the the um, educators said that it was of a higher standard than if they'd had um, you know their the typical practice in their own institutional based studios so they saw this richness of, of um, quality of work that was produced um, through through this interaction and through just opening up the classroom in this way um, I just put together this conceptual framework which was looking around some of the tensions and issues around intercultural learning, intercultural sensitivity and, and, and what this demands of students. And this is sort of a work in progress idea around these different types of engagement that students have through some of these endeavours that we've seen perhaps across these two projects. You know, this importance of the interracial engagement. Um, because students here get this chance to engage in this wider set of relationships, not just with students outside of their own classroom, internationally, but in terms of this relationship to their career and seeing it in a different perspective and who they are in relation to a wider perspective of the discipline. Um, this engagement is autonomy. You know, this, uh, what we're trying to do is prepare our students for uncertainty, for a complex world. And putting them in, in, in environments with staff as well, where they feel more exposed and vulnerable and having to manage that not knowing and having to be more spontaneous and reflexive. Um, and how students shift, mindsets shift, and we saw this happening during the, during the, the length of these projects and certainly afterwards in terms of their self-consciousness of what do I say, how can I contribute to feeling more sort of agented and having more control and feel, feeling able to give and see what you give, what, what you get back when you give. Um, the emotional engagement. Students need to be persistent and resilient often in these exchanges. You know, they don't get the feedback they want, but that's, that's life, isn't it? You know, you have to manage that. You have to work around that um, and develop that communication and in intrapersonal capacity. And again, this was this importance of how we integrate these talk types of um, projects into the curriculum, that they're not standing alone, that they have some integrity with other programs and that students see the connection and relevance that it has for them and staff too, you know, in terms of moving across, uh, across modules and projects. So um, just the, uh, a quick summary really, the ambitious projects, I mean they are, for those staff involved, new ways of working um, but they take a lot of time and effort, they're labour intensive to set up but the, what they provide and offer is certainly something that these staff and students are rolling out again, they're not saying okay that's it, we're not trying that again, They've, they're rolling out again this, this year. Um, so I've run out of time, the whole sort of format of the disruptive bite is changed, um, but yes, 
I, I, I could stop there. Do you have any questions that we have time for? If you have time, you could The first time that really, again, really good projects with students who have to have good reflective writing skills. Yes. Have to reflect on their experiences and kind of, yeah. and, and think how they think on their feet. Yes. And knowing in action. Yes. And knowing on action. These are good, really good. Were these actual, were these incorporated in, in the, as a module? Yes. yes. So this was module that's work that's, that's formally assessed. Yeah. So it's, they don't sit outside of modules. This was this was part of module work, and the old the old projects have this ambition because we're internationalising our curriculum. It's giving these students this opportunity to have this wider dialogue and to benefit from these exchanges. So it was. It would be good as part of like the advantage scheme as well. Something like I don't know how it would be adapted, but you know the advantage scheme where there's. Mm -hmm. Specifically geared, so those modules are specifically geared to developing work based skills. Yeah, I mean, I've got to say, a lot of the students in HLS they have a thousand hours of field work, you know, they are out there in practice settings, but to give them a more global perspective um, was what this sort of raised that ambition about. So, um, I, I think that there's a lot of scope for, for this type of exchange, and it does lend itself to other disciplines and transdisciplinary learning. Um, and I, I'm more than happy to, you know, offer my slides and notes because I've just raced through them and there are papers about these. Yes, yeah, the, the, um, well, the, the projects are up on the DMLL website um, and the reports are up there as well. So more detail about student experience and some of the, the resources from these, but also in Curve, there's the papers that have been published. So, yes. <laughs> I'm just interested in the in the mediation of these. So these are all mediated through English. They're not well. Actually, the the in the first um, example, the um, podcasts were done in the home language, and then we had our um, language students here translate them. So it was in Belgium and French. Um, the, but the UCT students from Cape Town were. Yes, we're, we're using English. Yes. So one of the things we're saying in language um, in yes. CMC is yeah. actually we need to be more involved in yeah. colleagues who are doing this sort of thing. We need yes. to get more transdisciplinary. Yeah, well, that was another great offshoot from this. That the, the vodcasts that were done by the Belgian students were given to the language department, and, and those students had the opportunity to do some translation work on the video with caption. Um, Absolutely, all those dialects, but they did just work with the English. We didn't go through Afrikaans dialect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, but, but yes, well, because actually, just, just a comment from one of the South African students was that there isn't a word for occupational therapy in Africa, in, in some of the Zulu languages. Um, so they were, I mean, some of our students think, can you imagine that? I mean, our profession maybe isn't that well known, but at least people know our titles, but not yeah. to have a word for that when you're going out to work in Cape Town, in some of those more rural communities. So it's our students were having to think, how would we deal with that, you know? So um, it really opened their eyes to, to a more global perspective, yeah. The, yeah. The, the two projects that you presented, they were very different in terms of levels of openness, because the second one was everything pretty much was, was open. In the open, well, yes. except for the Facebook. The first one, yes. It was uh, taking place in Moodle. Yes, on an open Moodle platform. Yeah. Do you think there could be opportunities for opening up some of the content in the previous one, or because yes. of the nature of the subject, yes. uh, maybe? Yeah, I think we 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 discuss this as a module team because the scenarios are very much based around practice based issues, but they're anonymized, so we're not actually naming patients. We're not. We're not being detrimental to staff either. You know, we had to have some etiquette around the vodcast and what, what, how they were to be shaped. So there shouldn't really be any, any concern. We didn't, we didn't at the time have ethical approval for opening it up. But I think in future runs, now seeing how they work and, and the benefit, there shouldn't be any problem because those scenarios will be useful for other disciplines to look at. You know, law students might be interested to look at some of the issues facing the health students. Um, it's so. about the linguistic link. I, mean, I can see it from both sides because, like you, I used to be a nurse and I'm now an academic writing tutor. Yes. But I went, I was working as a nurse, 
coming across adaptation nurses who came over from other countries, for example, India, without the linguistic skills, that kind of thing, yeah. that kind of project yeah. would have been really useful for them in that transition stage. Yes. Before yeah. we got here, yeah. we were thrown into the wards. Or yeah, whatever. yeah, yeah. It would have been so useful yeah. from yeah. linguistic, and you've also got that huge authenticity. Mm. Yes, issue, it's, which I think is just yeah. Got the <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I think that was yeah. that's the big message from the yeah. graduates. You know that um, I, I think maybe sometimes we we're developing scenarios that are quite idealistic. Mm. You know, we're trying to make them real life, but why not ask for the real life ones that are going on? Why not get those graduates? Because they really enjoyed that. It kept them somewhat yeah. connected to the university during their first year. Um, so. Um, I think that, that that was a reciprocal learning in that sense. With the three city you mentioned the first and second year students. Yeah. As you're running again. Yeah. Would the first year students from this, the last time, be the, the second year students? So would they yes. go through the thing again? Um, into the yeah, I think I think it's not exactly run again as it did this first time for Three City Link. I think um, they've got some changes that they wanted to bring on board because of of that issue. So, um, we've actually they're developing more to have an artist in residence come in um, and work with the students, still internationally focused, but getting them to do a different type of research work across different institutions. So, it's not exactly running in the same format as that first time. But I like those sustainable models um, because I think it is second years will be saying to first years, use this opportunity because maybe we were a bit anxious and held back last time and we're trying to encourage you to make use of this because you don't get many of these spaces to do this type of work and learn in this type of way. Um, so, yeah, I think well, we like those sustainable models because the lab is here to just do the experimental stuff and then sort of hand it back to say, okay, how are you going to continue to develop and roll that out? And then I think that the sustainability of this sort of thing with involvement of languages, you really are killing two birds with one stone. Yes, really, yeah. You? I mean, you know, there, there are yes. ways to better support each other in that sort of thing. Yeah, no, because they're always big learning curves, because they are labour intensive. Absolutely. And just the logistics of negotiating all those forums and the sets and you know the facilitation that's, yeah and that's very much where computer mediated communication which is a sub um, sort of research area of computer assisted yes. language learning has lots and lots of helpful hopefully yes. documentation yes it's always been very good at documenting what went wrong yeah no very honest. well i think i think no. that's it's good i mean i think so there's you can say well let's not go that way <laughs> yeah. you know mm -hmm things can feed each other though. yeah yes okay yes no thank you. thank you nice to see you we um we're experimenting with this type of format we had some technology issues as yes, normal <laughs> but please do connect if you'd like a card because maybe if you're thinking about doing any type of this thing you know to please get in touch all right of course yes yes Yes, yes, of course you're here. Yeah, okay, thanks again.